Hey everyone, it's Rod Santamassimo with the Massimo Group. And today, wow, what a panel we have for you. I'll start to my top right, and that's Mr. Bob Knackle, Chairman of Investment Sales in New York for JLL. Then to my left is Mr. Alan Buchanan, Principal of Lee and Associates, and I always get this last name wrong. <laughs> to my lower left is Candace. Chavalier, is that right? Chavalier. Chavalier, I'm sorry. In a name like Salamasimo, you think I get the name, last names right. With Sperryman S in Seattle, correct? Almost. Lee Almost. Associate. Lee, Lee Associate. Oh, cheese and crackers. I got two Lee folks here. Well, you two are going to be surprised in a little bit. So, um, the reason we're here, oh, and I can't forget, most tenured season Massimo coach Doug Molyneux of the Molyneux Group and our inaugural coach of the year. The reason Doug is here is because he actually coaches Alan Buchanan. Alan might need a little support today, a little shoulder to cry on. And uh, <laughs> I am the coach of Bob Knackle and Candice. Candice, who's your coach? Howard Meyer. Oh, one of our other original coaches and coach, prior coaches of the year. We're here to share with you what we all been doing, specifically Candice, Bob, and Alan, over the last six weeks, what's working, what's resonating, and then also what we're gonna to plan to do the following six weeks. But before we do that, I wanna share with you how we got here. So how we got here was that about six weeks ago, Kansas coach, Howard Meyer said, Rod, we need to do something for our members, our coaching clients to get them to you know, focus on aiming but COVID. And so his idea, which I loved, was called the March Madness. So we created a March Madness. In fact, what I'm gonna do is really quickly to share with you what we created. So this was our March Madness tournament in which our members competed on a variety of metrics. Those metrics included calls attempted, calls completed, inactive client calls, and referrals and or leads. Now, every week they had no idea what I would pick, but I would pick some metric at the end of the week and I look at all their numbers and we got down more and more and more and more until we had our final five. We took an extra bonus person there. And then we had our final three, who you see here today. And today we're actually down to our final two, those final two being Mr. Knackle and Mr. Buchanan, East, West, institutional company, not so institutional, right? It's just where it should be. And Candace is here because she kicked butt as well. So we're gonna get into all that. We're actually gonna announce the winner, the first ever world champion of the Massimo March Metric Madness will be announced today. The winner does get $1,000 of a coaching credit and their coach does get $1,000 straight out. And I can pay myself, Bob. I just realized that. <laughs> there you go. So, so with that said, that's some fun we'll have in a little bit. But right now, we got to talk about what's working. And the reason we did this March Madness is we want to talk to our clients, our inactive clients, prospects, and share with them what they need to hear to become a resource. So I'm going to start with the number one seed in the tournament overall, and that was Mr. Knackle. So, Bob, what worked? What worked to allow you to move forward these last six weeks? You know, Rod, I think one of the things I, I love so much about this business is that it really is not all that complicated. It's blocking and tackling. And uh, one of the great things that I get out of coaching is that I'm accountable to you. And I think one of the things that was great about this uh, contest was that not only were we accountable to you guys, but uh, we also had the competitive juices flowing. So it was added incentive to just get back to those basics of blocking and tackling, making phone calls, making sure you're keeping in touch with people regularly, making sure you're sending your, your email blasts out. And, you know, one of the things that I thought was very interesting and, and probably one of the uh, benefits to the environment that we're operating in now is that the nature of the phone calls has been very different. Uh, I think it, three, two months ago, it would have been very strange to be talking to a client and say, so where are you, uh, where, where are you right now? Uh, are you in your primary residence, your secondary residence? Are you sequestered somewhere? Um, are you with your family? 
how many kids do you have? Where do they go to school? Are they in school? But this has given an opportunity to, um, to communicate with uh, clients very regularly. It seems like everybody has wanted to talk longer. One of the things that I noticed uh, and I think has uh, you know, impacted the number of calls I was able to make is that each conversation was a lot longer than it typically is because you spend several minutes talking about personal stuff, then you talk about business a little bit. Um, but I think the, the thing that worked best was just having added incentive besides the regular daily, weekly, monthly, annual incentive to get on the phone because if you're not on the phone, you're out of business. Uh, but this was added incentive to get on the phone and talk to folks. And there was a little bit of a different twist to it in that we really could personalize it and get to know your clients on a little bit of a different level than you had historically. And that's one of the big benefits that I think I've gotten out of the past six weeks uh, is getting to know my clients on a little bit of a different basis than I had known some of them previously. Okay. And I'll come back to Bob in a little bit. And by the way, use the Q&A box for specific questions. Please <clears throat> engage. Alan, you, you took about it a different route. First of all, those first few rounds of the contest, no one could touch you. You were almost invincible with the numbers you were putting up, but you seem to have a strategy going in and going throughout. So what did you do that you found successful over this term? Well, the first thing I did is I listened to my coach who has, uh, in the two years we've been together, never steered me wrong. So I got to give a big shout out to my man, uh, Mr. Molyneux. But um, I was a little concerned initially that I would sound like an ambulance chaser if I started making dials. And I didn't want to come off as an ambulance chaser. I wanted to come off as a solution provider. So Doug and I worked very closely in developing a real specific message. Now, mind you, this was mid-March. This is before the CARES Act. This is before the CARES Act had even been, even been proposed in Congress. So we didn't know what sort of governmental help was going to be around. We didn't know how long we were going to be sequestered. And so I wanted to make sure that the messaging was spot on and the messaging was built around, you know, how can we help you? Um, what sort of resources can we provide? So I spent a lot of time uh, developing those resources and spent a lot of time with that messaging. And uh, when I started dialing the phone, I was, I was met with an, an awful lot of gratitude from the people I connected with. And so that made uh, a great incentive to continue to dial the phone. Perfect. And then I'll come back to you, Alan, with specifics. Candace, uh, I, I share with you, and I don't want to embarrass you here, but I'm sure like all of us, we've been inundated with emails. And it's rare that I look forward to emails, but whatever it was, I always look forward to yours over the last six weeks because they were informative. They stood out above everyone else's. So you must have taken, did you take a, you just take a purposeful approach to how you're going to approach this issue and the market? Well, I have to say that um, I, I kind of echo Alan's sentiments about, um, you know, recognizing a real need to reach out to our clients during this time. And it's almost, um, you know, with all of the CARES Act and for us in uh, the Seattle market, a lot of shifts in legislation that are really affecting the multifamily market, which is my focus area, um, it, it became almost important for me to be, become a reporter on what was changing. And every single week, there were such dynamic shifts in our market that um, it, it was kind of creating opportunity out of a very challenging environment. You know, you, you sort of put certain initiatives on your radar with regard to, you know, I need to do email marketing, I need to do more outreach. And this was the perfect opportunity to use what was incredible content, new information that people really wanted to have as a way to start that campaign, if you will. And um, it, it's about 6,000 people in the local market um, that are reviewing it every week. And, you know, um, every week a storyline comes up that is, is major. I mean, there was basically this week we sat on a council call and they just banned um, evictions for six months after the emergency is over. Wow. And so, you know, every week we've had incredible information to share with clients. And then, you know, to follow on to um, those emails, m more importantly, even is that outreach. And I would echo what Bob said about um, what an opportunity it is to connect with clients on a different level at this time. 
people are out of their comfort zone. They're out of their schedules. They're on their cell phones. They don't have anywhere else to go or anyone else to talk to. So it's been a really nice opportunity to connect on, um, on a deeper level with um, everyone struggling with those shifts of um, people working from home, people working with kids from home, and, um, and all of those shifts, or concern about mortality and, and those deeper conversations that would have been kind of bizarre to even go into, um, but we have this forum at the moment to, to be able to talk about those things. Well, Candace, that's awesome. Candace, while I'm speaking to Bob and Alan, I want you to check out the question from Aaron because it addresses you. Uh, you have a question too, Alan, I want you to address when we get to you. But what I, Candace, the word you said there, I think really stuck out. And you described yourself and, and your what you were doing as being a reporter. Wow. I mean, that is an incredible positioning and role in this market, right? We talk about being a resource. I'm not talking about CNN or Fox or negative news. You were a reporter. You were creating clarity for your constituents. That's what you were doing. And again, the best emails I read during the entire process came from you because I felt like I was living in your community and I can deal with the challenges and got some information. So kudos to you. Great job. Thank Bob, you. let's jump back to you now. You actually did some specific things though that you could not have done before, frankly, during a pre-COVID period. So I think two things come to mind as your coach. I know number one, tell us what you did during the week that you couldn't do otherwise if it was a normalized period. Uh, you're talking about the uh, the on boots on the ground canvassing? Yep. Yeah, I mean, you know, New York City is such a congested place that there are times when it can take you an hour to get from one side of the island to the other. Um, but because the city is so empty now, uh, it took a couple of days and went back to New York and drove the streets. I had my partner, John Hageman, driving. I had uh, tax lot maps in the front with me, and we covered 50 blocks on the east side of town one day. We did 40 blocks another day. I'm going back next week for two days, and literally there was nobody on the street. We would stop the car in the middle of Third Avenue, and there were no cars around. We'd look around, take some pictures of buildings, jot some notes down on the map, uh, and so now uh, I have dozens of leads that have come from what I saw out on the street and there's no replacement as you could google map and you can do everything but unless you're really there and you see exactly what's going on it gives you a different perspective and I think that was one of the things that um, really uh, helped stimulate thoughts in my mind uh, thought to call a client about one thing did they think about this because that guy is doing that and this woman is doing that um, and uh, I actually I picked up several leads from that that I think are going to turn into business. There's a, a development site that's worth about $90 million uh, on the east side that I believe I'm going to be hired shortly to sell. Uh, there's another deal where there's a, uh, I looked at the capital stack and found out that the fee owner is not in the money, uh, contacted the, uh, the lender who is a private lender. I think I'm going to be hired to sell a a $50 million first mortgage position on a property. And these are things that all came from getting in the car, driving around, uh, you know, having to bring your lunch in a brown paper bag because there's no place to get food. And, uh, but the streets were empty. So it was a perfect opportunity. I never, I, my plan originally, I, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. And the plan was always wake up at five o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning and go drive around for a few hours when nobody's out. But this was even better because it was the middle of the day. Uh, it wasn't a limited amount of time. There was nobody around. Uh, and I, I plan to do this. I want to do the whole island of Manhattan before I'm finished. Uh, awesome. I, I, just, I want everyone to think about, it doesn't matter if you're an investment focused or a tenant rep or a landlord rep or a property manager or a mortgage broker, what a role you play out there. That approach, boots on the ground, right? And think about from that aspect and what information you can get and from Bob's perspective, right? <laughs> what leads you can get. Now, Bob, before I jump over to Alan, you also did something else that 
you had never done before. In fact, none of us would think about doing this before. You actually picked up the phone on Sundays. What Absolutely. the heck was that about? Absolutely. You know, I was, and that's, I think, one of the downsides of, of this uh, pandemic uh, is that the days of the week all kind of become homogenous. You kind of lose track. I, I sit here, I, I, like, I think today's Thursday. I'm not positive. It's like uh, you can't keep track of what's what. And, you know, there are so many of these video conferences that you have. We have them internally, the several different uh, divisions and initiatives at JLL that we have uh, video conference calls, updates. I have one with my personal team. Uh, I have some with different boards that I'm on. And Monday seems to be the day that I'm just on video conferences all day. And my goal is always to get to, to connect with 10 owners a day. My Mondays were, you know, two this Monday, three this Monday, and I felt kind of behind the eight ball. So I said, you know what, let me get ahead of this a little bit. Let me call on Sunday. So I started calling people on Sunday and I'm like, look, I'm really, I apologize for calling you on a Sunday. Do you mind? And most people were like, Hey, Monday, Wednesday, Sunday, what's the difference? It's all the same. I'm sitting at home and it doesn't matter to me. And it was, it was great. So Sunday became a work day. Um, and, uh, it always, it made me feel good to get off to a great start. I'd come flying into Monday and knowing I'd have a lot of video conferences, but I had, 10 connections, 12 connections, one case, 16 connections on a Sunday. And I was like, this is awesome. Other people aren't bothering my clients. Then they don't have video conferences on Sunday. It's probably the highest probability day to call somebody and get them on the phone, provided they don't mind speaking to you on a Sunday. That's just fantastic. I, I know a lot of you are shaking your head going, I can never do that. Well, folks are not going to church unless they're online, obviously. They're not going out for Sunday brunch they're available. And like everything else, there's no gatekeeper. So Doug, I'm going to jump to you first because you're coaching Alan. And after the first week, Alan and I had an interview and he starts sharing with me this, this strategy you guys were doing uh, with A, Bs and segmenting and going after it. Can you shed some light on what he did or should I jump to Alan for that specifically? Doug? Jump to Alan on that specifically. I think that the, um, you know, the, the main thing that Alan did is he expanded his, his database significantly over the period of time and as a result of the hundreds and hundreds of conversations that he did have uh he he met hundreds literally hundreds of people that he never met before which is really an incredible impact to his business going forward um and that's i think the most important thing that he accomplished over the last six weeks alan how'd you do it well, it's, it's uh, just kind of dovetailing on what Bob said. You know, uh, the next time I dial on Sunday will be the second time. <laughs> I had never dialed the phone on Sunday. I, I, I had taken uh, selected meetings, but, but uh, my Sunday's, Sunday's kind of sacrosanct. And frankly, I don't do a lot of, a lot of work on Saturdays either. But uh, throughout, this, throughout this contest period of time, I've done a lot of dialing on Sundays. And a very funny thing happened, and that is people actually picked up the phone on Sunday, like Bob was saying. It was really remarkable to me how many connections that I made, not, number one on Sundays, but number two after hours, because I would, I would make it a point to get up very, very early in the morning. I'm an early riser as it is. Get up very, very early in the morning and make a ton of dials. And I, I found that calling the, the sorts of folks that I was calling in, in many cases, they're a, an owner occupant or a tenant in a building. And in many cases, they're there at 630 in the morning and they pick up the phone and, Hey, may I speak to Bob? Yeah, this is Bob. What, what, what can I do for you? Kind of thing. So um, I, I have, I have really discovered that there's a, there's a whole different time and extra hours in the day where you can actually make contacts so once I had a, a number of these conversations sort of log, then I went in as Doug was referring and I, and I started categorizing them based on a, hey, this is definitely a guy that, uh, or gal that I need to follow up with in the future because there's a requirement here. Um, here's someone that maybe not quite as urgent. Here's someone that uh, even less urgent still. And so a real good um, A, B, D sort of category emerged from that. Okay. And do you share a little light into what, what makes an A, a B, and a D? 
a lot of it's subjective. Um, I, I really, I really put it back to, Hey, is there, is there a deal here in the next, you know, nine to 12 months? Right. Um, maybe they, maybe they share with you during the conversation we're going to be looking or we have a lease that's coming up or, uh, we've always thought about buying a building or any of those sorts of things that becomes an A and also the chemistry, you know, um, a lot of folks were just very, very appreciative that I had taken the time to pick up the phone and call them and uh, really appreciate the fact that you're not trying to sell me anything. You're trying to serve as a resource. That means a lot. So when the smoke clears here, let's make sure we reconnect and, and see if we can do some business together. So those fall into the A category. And then um, if, if one of those elements is missing, probably down into the B, and then uh, um, all of those missing, it, it would fall into the D category. And it's something that Doug shared, and, and we'll get to your numbers in a few minutes, which again are astronomical, but it's one thing making a lot of dials. It's another thing having a lot of conversations. Um, and in one of our metrics was an inactive client. For those who don't know the Mossimo vernacular, that just means someone you work with previously, or you would call them a past client, but always keep them engaged and retain those relationships. That's an inactive client. That was a metric. But I was, I was pleasantly surprised, uh, even as, a, he's in a, as a, the opponent of you, quite frankly, Alan, of the number of new relationships you created during the last six weeks. So how do you do it? Someone asked the question, you're only calling existing. So how do you determine, how do you create these new relationships? Yeah, so um, I, I'm fortunate because I use, I use Client Look. I'm gonna give a plug to my good, the good folks at Client Look. I use Client Look as my CRM. Uh, we have painstakingly, uh, my, uh, my son-in-law and my associate Joshua Harper and I have painstakingly worked on building that database over the past six years since he's been with us. And I, I have my, my, uh, my prospects categorized as either tenants or owner occupants or investor owners. And an investor owner would be most likely someone that, that, that maybe a Candace or a Bob would call more, more frequently. But um, the initial messaging was all about tenants, right? All about tenants because my initial messaging was around becoming a resource to help them with their landlord and providing some rent relief because I saw that as an immediate way that I could add value. It reminds me a little bit of the early uh, part of the decade where we were doing blends and extends. And so I saw that as, as sort of the low hanging fruit. Uh, talk to tenants, find out what you can about, about their situation, help them if you can with their landlord and, and uh, either providing some talking points as to how to negotiate a rent relief or in some cases I actually got involved and did it on their behalf. So uh, the messaging uh, then evolved, uh, evolved from there into more of a CARES Act resource. It then evolved from there into, you know, the IRS made some changes in the, in the way in which tax deferred exchanges are, uh, are noticed and, and, and perfected. So I was able to do a little video interview with a tax deferred exchange specialist of mine. Then the SBA came in and started forgiving payments for six months. I did another a video interview with uh, with a young lady that is a CDC provider. So the messaging just sort of evolved. And with every evolution, I was able to make really solid connections, which will uh, which will lead to, to, to future business. Incredible. Uh, I think you're seeing some common thread amongst the three folks here. These top producers are, they are not facilitating transactions during these conversations. At least that's not the number one goal going in. No. Is it, is it going to happen? For some of them, obviously, it had. It really was being that resource, the reporter, the resource that Candace was. Alan was a resource, kept on top of everything. 1031, CARES Act, PPP, emergency loans. That's what we did. Now, it worked. We're going to figure out what we're going to do going forward. So, Candace, let me jump to you now. So, you are this resource, this reporter. So, what did you see in return? I mean, did you see a return? And one question before we get there, because someone asked a question. How did you aggregate all this data? Because it was fake, there's a lot of information. It's dynamic, it's changing. Did you spend hours at a time aggregating it? How did you get it done? Well, um, I also, you know, I've been using CRM for many years. Um, I've been in the industry for 16 years. So everyone and anyone who's ever reached out to me um, regarding a listing or, um, or that I know has ownership in the, in the market, I've been adding them on the list. And I kind of had one of those moments where I was like, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to send it to 
everybody, <laughs> like every single email that I ever had, because this was the moment to do that, right? And if people didn't want it, they can unsubscribe, all of that. But what, again, there was this moment in time where people really wanted information and they really wanted um, to understand what was happening. And so uh, that, was, that was a great moment to be able to launch some of these um, initiatives that you sort of, again, you kind of feel like you should be doing it. Like, for example, breaking down barriers around, um, you know, creating a video, video content or a vlog and figuring out how to s subtitle. I mean, just things like that, that, yeah, it's kind of on the back burner and you kind of meant to do it. But there was a lot of like, well, I'm just going to throw it out there. Let's just do it. You know what I mean? Let's just press go on the 6,000 people or what have you and, and see how it goes. And it's been well received. And I feel thankful for that going forward. I think, you know, we're going to have to recognize that the flow of this imperative information is going to get tiresome. And so figuring out the right rhythm going forward um, and then really using kind of like what Alan said, that segmentation, using that, um, these conversations that we've had, that's actually been the major um, follow up that I've been doing from a calling standpoint is actually refining who it is that we talk to. I find that my database is actually way too big. Um, and so really identifying who it is that we should be working with, should be talking to, want to work with. Um, those are sort of the keys that I've really been focusing on. So you have this huge funnel and how do you create the highest likelihood clients, the ones that you enjoy working with that might have repeat business. Those are the people that maybe you're focusing on and letting a couple of this, you know, sm too small, too random, not motivated, let those, you know, give them those emails, but maybe don't put them on you know, more of a, a high touch uh, rotation. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Hey, BK, people are asking, what were you looking for when you drove around? Or what are you looking for when you're driving around? There's certain factors, certain aspects. I, mean, I know you have tax maps in front of you. Is there something you're looking for as you're driving around that sticks out? Yeah, well, I mean, a number of things, actually. And, you know, a big part of my practice is selling land or development sites. Uh, so not only did we log all the existing sites where properties have been demolished uh, or construction is underway, uh, but we looked at potential sites. Uh, you know, five uh, little dumpy buildings on a corner that clearly have higher value as land than as the income producing potential of uh of the uh oh look at this oh, man, we got a cheerleader every team needs a cheerleader so, <laughs> <laughs> i know i'd reach out to your longtime partner your brother in business mr paul massey mr massey thank you so much for joining us rod glad to be here very glad <laughs> to be here well, what a nice surprise good to see you dr <laughs> you too Hey, Today's the day where BK is competing for this crown, and we have hundreds of people across North America. The sold out webinar, which I'm pumped for. But I thought I'd ask you to join us for just a brief moment. What makes BK BK, and what are some of the characteristics others can try to exemplify? What would they be, Paul? Do you mind sharing? Yeah, well, um, first of all, anyone who's competing with him, give up now. <laughs> 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 it's uh, it's uh, it's that simple. I have a I have a thing that uh, we always Bob and I always talk about. With history repeats itself, right? I mean, he, this is a guy who was the president of his kindergarten class, captain of his <laughs> baseball team at Penn. Um, he, he's a scratch golfer, and he hardly ever plays. There's nothing the guy can't do. He is he is unbelievable. He uh, you know, he'll be up before you. And he'll be on the phone more than anyone else. He's, um, he's, uh, I saw him riding around Manhattan in the middle of uh, the, the pandemic yesterday. He, is, uh, he has no fear. Okay. <laughs> well, Classic. Thank you, Paul. That was it. Paul, that was it. That was quick. Thank you so much for your time today. So, BK, are they back? Paul, any parting shots? Any parting words? No, nah, no, Bob knows I love him. Um, I would say that uh, 
everyone who's working with Rod is incredibly smart to be doing so. There's no one better nationally. Oh, damn, this is good. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll sign off now, but uh, good luck to all of you. Thank you. Pablo, Thank you. Thanks, thanks for coming. Great to see you. Say hi to the family. Will do. Okay, so. So I've got my, uh, I got my kindergarten teacher that's about to give me a testimonial. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> hey, you have Holy dog. cow, man. You the have dog. Pulpit. Everyone needs a cheer. Everyone needs a cheerleader. So we still have time left in the show, by the way. You yes, never I know, have, who, you never have know who's going to show up. I have my notes, my notes, Rod, to make sure that I say anybody who is thinking about competing with Alan Buchanan, the cannon, just needs to give up and concede. So uh, this could be pretty interesting as we get down to the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look, you never know who's going to show up in these calls. We got another half hour to go. So going on next is now what? Now what? Look, we 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 all changed what we were doing. We became a resource. We were able to articulate what the stimulus package was all about. It created clarity. Candace did it. Alan did it. Bob found a way to adapt and shift. But you know what? States are now reopening. They are. Now, New York will definitely be last, I would believe, and California also. So definitely you, you do a little different. But knowing what you know now, what's the plan of attack going forward? BK, I'm going to start with you. Knowing what you know now, you, you staying at the same pace, or what will you do differently, if anything? I, I think that it is, you know, the fundamentals are always the fundamentals. Uh, and while we have to stick to our core values, our core principles, our core behaviors, we have to constantly adapt to a changing environment. And I think we're going to see very, very rapid change over the next 60 to 90 days. Uh, I think right now we are like uh, the building's on fire and the smoke is pouring out of the building and you can't see because the smoke is there. You think you heard a noise over here. You think you saw this. You don't really know if you saw that or not. Um, I think in, uh, in 60 days or so, a lot of the smoke will be gone and there's, the building may still be on fire, but maybe it's contained and maybe we understand a little bit better about how to fight the fire or deal with it. Um, but I think that there's a little bit more clarity that's needed. And, you know, you have to constantly adapt to your circumstances. And, um, you know, a buddy of mine in Philadelphia passed along a, um, a quote that I'm looking for uh, from Charles Darwin. And uh, I think it was the... Uh, if I could find it, I'd love to share it with you because I think it is, it is so great. And uh, you may have to come back to me because I don't, I'm, I'll try to find it as, I'm, as we're going. But basically it says that the, the sum and substance of it is, it's not the smartest person in the room that wins. Uh, it's not the strongest person in the room that wins. It's the person who can adapt to change and work together collaboratively to figure out how to defeat the threats that are in front of you. Uh, and that is the, the, the uh, you know, the Darwin's theory in a nutshell. And I think a lot of it has to do, that, that's very applicable to what we're doing. We have to constantly adapt, use the resources available to us, collaborate with people that can help us. Uh, and before you know it, um, you know, it, uh, you'll be in a, a good spot. So constant adaptation, but stick to the fundamentals. Keep making your calls, do your prospecting, your presence campaign, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Bob, thank you for that. But we got another cheerleader that just joined us. Yes, the one and only president of Lee and Associates. Now, Jeff, thank you for joining us today. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much, Rod. I appreciate the call earlier and the invitation. I hope everyone's doing well. Well, Jeff, we got three finalists, Mr. Bob Knackle, Candice, and Alan, who you both know, both lean associates advisors. I don't know how it turned out like that, but throughout the entire country, we have two lean associates and one JLL. So what are you going to share? Now, Alan's a finalist with Bob. Alan's going up against Bob today. Today, they're going to be crowned the champion. So what makes Alan Alan, and why do you think he's in this position? 
<clears throat> well, there's only one person in the entire world that could get me to put on a bow tie while being sheltered in place at my house, I can tell you that. So if any of you know Alan well, and I think many of you do, um, so Alan and I share some sartorial interests, and, um, and, and I'm a fan of Alan's for a number of reasons. And it's in, number one, I think we have a really close personal friendship, and I think that was born out of um, the professional relationship, and Alan's been incredibly supportive of me. Alan's provided great leadership. So as a broker, um, Alan has really paved the way for brokers all over the country to figure out how to present themselves in a, a, a social media um, identity. And I think Alan's done a great job for Lean Associates. He's been a leader in his office. He's been incredibly careful about adding members to his team. Um, I know what a great job he's done with Josh, and I know what a great job he's done with previous people that have been on his team. Um, I would tell you that there's one thing that I admire most about Alan, and, and there's a lot of things, but the thing I admire most is Alan's interest in becoming better and reinventing himself. And I know that when Alan, Alan has a 25, 30 year plus career, and then he started working with you pretty late in, in, in his career, maybe the last two or three years. <laughs> and not, not that it's coming to the end, but you know, after a lot of success, it would be hard <clears throat> for other people to say, I can do this better and I want to be better and I want to find some new tools, resources, and methods. And so I have a tremendous amount of respect for Alan to set his ego aside, to want to be better, to represent himself, his office, his brand, his team, Lee and Associates. So what makes Alan, Alan, I think is this selfless approach that he has. Um, you know, you, you've got to be somewhat selfless and if, set your ego aside. If you're going to do a, a podcast every Tuesday morning from your car. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but but in, a, in a really serious tone, I would say that Alan has, uh, Alan's been a great representative of the company and, and, and he's been just a great beacon for people who are in the business a little while and who have been in the business for quite a while and who want to be better and who value what their clients say about them and the kind of resource that they want to be with <coughs> clients and the example that they want to set. Well, uh, Jeff, I cannot thank you enough for taking time away from your busy day. Um, I really appreciate it. I know Alan's thrilled to be Candace. Have you met Candace, Jeff? Of course. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I, no, I would say that. So I met Candace when um, she was at a critical decision making point about how she was going to continue to represent her team. And we're thrilled. And, and you know, so I'm a. I, I've met Candace, we've spoken. I'm a huge fan of what she's done on the social media platform and the information she sends out every week. And, um, and, and she does a great job in her local market. And I think there's only room up for Candace to have a, a larger identity um, within Lee and Associates. I mean, she's been here for you know a cup of coffee or two so far, um, but I'm really looking forward to introducing more people to Candace and for her to have a bigger impact on the organization. Oh, I see Candace as if not your top producer soon, one of the top, without a doubt. So, Jeff, I got to tell you, it's, I'm not a bow tie guy, but it looks good on you, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's hard to pull off. My family thought I was crazy when I walked downstairs. But I would just <laughs> add one, one last thing, Rod. You know, I, I want to thank you for what you do. And, and Alan has shared with me the value and the meaning of the calls that you conduct every day and that it's not just fluff, that it's real support. And... And so I know there's a number of Lean Associates people that participate. So from an industry perspective and from a company perspective, I just want to say thank you for everything that you've been able to do in your leadership during this difficult time. Oh, thank you so much, sir. I greatly appreciate that. Greatly. Thank you, sir. You Thanks, care. Jeff. Bye -bye. I love you, man. Bye -bye, everyone. Thank you, Candace, Alan. Best of luck. Okay. So the reason I have these folks, now some context, I'll say, if you don't know, Jeff is the president of Lean Associates. He guides that ship and uh, he's doing it. I don't, I want to say at least, Al, help me, how many years now? How, how long has Jeff been CEO? Yeah. Uh, I think he's going on six. Six years. And for those yeah. who don't know, Paul Massey, if you're not from New York, he co-owned a company called Massey Knackle, which was the dominant firm in New York over every other firm for 25, 26 plus years. So we just thought we thought they didn't expect that, obviously. We want to give them a little kudos to what they've done the last six weeks. Now, there may be more guests coming, but we got some <laughs> questions. 
Alan, I'll go to you because someone asked, and, and Jeff just asked the question, just said it. What do we do with the juniors during this time? What do you do with your junior team members right now to keep them engaged? It's a great question. And I, I struggled with that initially because uh, it's, it's truly a family affair in our case. Um, our son-in-law, Joshua Harper, is, is um, my transaction coordinator and my, uh, uh, my right-hand man, if you will. I know Bob's got a dozen of those. I just have one. But, um, yeah, so what I had Joshua doing is he was, uh, he was sending out pre-information, if you will, um, emailing a list of folks that I was going to call that day. And, and no, under normal circumstances, we would have done that via a, a prospect letter. But given uh, the speed with which we had to adapt, we were sending out emails that would precede a call. So every day he would have, uh, you know, a number of those to send out. He would get those sent out before I started dialing. And uh, in many cases, I'd, you know, I'd get someone and they'd say, oh, yeah, we got your email. And that was very well done, da, 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 what have you. So um, that, that's, the way I've, that's the way I've kept him busy. And as, as this thing has matured into now it's, what, sixth or seventh week, um, we also have some, uh, some deal follow-up and some information collateral that's, that's being sent out, all that sort of thing being cleaned up. Um, if I found issues in the database, uh, normally we have an intern do that, but, uh, but Josh has been doing that on our behalf. So it uh, was a bit, a bit of a challenge. He's also got two little ones that keep him quite busy, but uh, we, we managed to, to, keep him, to keep him very, very busy. Hi, Natalie. Well, speaking of busy, it's the one and the only Natalie Wainwright from Las Vegas, nonetheless. Natalie, how are you? Yes. I'm great. How are you? I'm doing perfect. But look, I, I saw in, in, in the social media world that yes. you actually made a prediction. I want you to repeat that prediction in regards to Vegas odds for who would win the Massimo March Metric Madness Championship. And then we asked the, the, the social media sphere to give us their input. Did that change the odds? So what were the odds? What are they now? Well, the odds, we all know that Buchanan was the underdog and that Knackle was the one that was set to win. It went from a 15-point spread. Now we're at a one-point spread. So social media darling Buchanan might come in in the end. So who's favored, <laughs> Buchanan or Knackle? I'm going for Buchanan. I hate to, I mean, I'm looking at Knackle wow. right now. So, but yes, I'm, wow. I'm a Buchanan fan. Amazing. <laughs> Hey, Natalie, before we let you go, you are tremendous for this industry and what you're doing. Wow. The tenant, the T-Rep, tenantrep.com, wow, what a great idea. Give everyone your Twitter handle at the very least, whoever knows they need to follow you. You are so sweet, Rod, thank you. So my, my handle is Natalie underscore CRE10X. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, it's great to see some familiar faces. Let, thanks for letting me come have fun with you. Well, Natalie, thank you so much for being part of this. You take care. Absolutely. Good luck, guys. Thanks, Natalie. Bye. Oh, so BK, are you now a one-point favorite? Oh, <laughs> it's gone down to this. <laughs> and by the way, no one knows what the metric is except I know what it is this week. So we'll get to that in a few minutes. Let's still talk to the group, though. Look, I commit to all of you. Yeah, we're having some fun. That's part of this. But we want to get to your questions. They really are important. Um, Candice, how do you work with your team, especially from this virtual standpoint? How do you make it work? I know for a fact you've got a huge pitch coming up tomorrow. How are you going to do it in this COVID period? Uh, so we have been using Microsoft Teams. Um, I know you are a Zoom lover, um, which is great. Uh, Microsoft um, has a pretty big presence here in Seattle. So um, uh, and and it, it will probably put my kids through college since that's where my husband works. Um, so we're using <laughs> Microsoft Teams and it's been great actually. Um, we have been able to collaborate as a team that way, work with our marketing department, operations, um, connect as a uh, Lean Associates greater team or, um, or hop off and, and huddle as the, uh, the multifamily team as well. So that's been um, a great tool. Okay. Uh, thank you. And uh, you know what? I'm kind of zoomed out <laughs> when it comes to Candace. So I actually am going to look into Microsoft Teams because I think it's some features we need to consider from our coaching perspective. So I get it. Hey, BK, I'm coming back to you now in this rotation. People are jumping on the question and answer box and asking you specifically, okay, so you drive the market. 
and then what? Are you calling people straight from your car? Are you asking about their, or telling about their buildings? How are you opening up a conversation? What are you doing? Sometimes, sometimes I'm making calls right there. We drove past and I saw one building, uh, it had a fire in it. It was almost uh, burned to the ground. I immediately had hags go on online, figure out who owned it. Turned out to be a client of mine. I called him up, hey, what happened? Told me what was going on. He's gonna rehab the building and hold on to it. But that's an example of, you know, if even if you were looking on Google's ma Google Maps, uh, unless that fire had happened uh, months ago when Google was driving the streets, you wouldn't have known that. So that, that was an example of something that you pick up on the fly that uh, you wouldn't get unless you were out actually on the street. Okay, I'm gonna ask you all this question um, because it, it's the question seems of the day right now. What the hell can you say about property values? How can you <laughs> possibly tell someone what their property is worth? Either a lease rate or a value. So BK, they're gonna call you up, you have these calls and say, hey BK, what's my property worth? How are you gonna figure it out? You know what, for the first time in my career, I have no idea. <laughs> I've always always prided myself on you know being able to peg values within three or four uh, percent, and that was a very very long standing track record because we always track what the BOV is we give the owner and what we actually sell the property for, and it was always plus or minus four uh, percent. Today, if I was within twenty five percent, I'd feel pretty good about myself. Uh, the fact is, uh, and it's probably like this in most markets around the country in New York. You really have no idea what something is worth. That's one of the one of the impacts of all that smoke being in our eyes, is we don't have enough data points to point to. If if I I, I would say that even transactions that were under hard contract pre-COVID, that did close post-COVID, even if they were renegotiated, that renegotiated price is not indicative of current market value today because there may have been externalities that impacted why. The value went down two percent versus twelve percent versus twenty-two percent. You know, you don't know. So it's only the transactions where the contract was signed after mid to late March that are closing that are statistically significant for trying to determine value today. And just a handful of transactions is not going to be enough to really know because every property is so different. So that's why, again, I think two or three months from now, we'll have more data points. It'll start to become a little clearer. Uh, we're looking very, very closely at bidding activity now on everything. Comparable sales are completely worthless today in terms of figuring out what something is worth. It, what, what that will tell you is what pre-COVID values were. We know what pre-COVID values were. It's the post-COVID value that we're trying to figure out. And all I can say is try to gather as much information as you possibly can on what contract or, or bidding activity is on active listings that are still on the market. And that will be the best early indication of what real value is. Thank you for that, BK. Alan, thoughts? Yeah, echo that sentiment 110%. Um, I have two deals, one we just relaunched, one we are launching. And the relaunch was a, was a pre-COVID, unfortunately, uh, cratered transaction. We're now back on the market. And early indications are uh, offers are coming in about 20% below where we transacted, where we were under contract before. Um, so that's, like, like Bob said, you're going to have to have a number of deals to point to before you really start to see a trend line. Uh, but that's a good early indication. Okay, Candice? Well, it's an interesting conversation. One of the things we've been sharing with um, pers prospective uh, folks that want to actually sell their property is um, timing that release of marketing with the opening up of um, business again here in, in Washington State. We feel that it's pretty important to be on the starting line of, of that process, um, particularly because appraisers and lenders have will have no other data points to point to so because there is a fog let's go with let's go early so that we can take advantage of the fact that the only data that's out there is pre-covid um, and then 
I think we're going to see um, some real impacts in the medium term as the real impact on the economy here locally becomes more visible. Kind of like what Bob's saying, as the smoke is blowing out of the building and you can really see the damage, I think that that's when we'll start to see a pullback of value as well. That's going to be that much more time that tenants may or may not have been able to pay. So you've got some risk from a net operating income standpoint. And probably we're going to see cap rates, you know, people assigning more risk to the market and, and expecting um, higher cap rates. So you've kind of got a double whammy there. Um, so being early off the block, I think, is going to be to the benefit of um, those that are interested, you know, in selling and, and it was part of their original business plan for timing. Um, and I do think kind of late summer, early fall, we'll see a lot more of that kind of distress product that um, it's just been, you know, time kind of wasting away through this crisis. And that's probably where the buying opportunities will come about. Love it. Um, Doug, before I, do you have anything to share, Doug, or add, Doug? I would just say that I agree with what everybody just said about pricing, but it is somewhat property specific. I think the biggest challenge that you have right now is a lot of players are going to be out of the market because a lot of lenders are going to be out of the market. How can I loan on a shopping center if I don't know what the rents or the debt coverage ratio is going to look like two months out, yeah. uh, you know, and, and, and get a decent loan to value. So the people on the sideline that have, have cash right now that they can invest are probably going to get some pretty good deals short term. Um, I will add to what Jeff said, what, what makes Alan, Alan, uh, he just forgot to mention uh, Carla. Indeed. Yeah, I didn't have to hold, I didn't have to hold Alan accountable, had Carla for that. I just had to encourage him and pick him back up off the floor every day. Yeah, and I have a hard no dial. Uh, she said, you've dialed the phone so much in the last, I haven't seen you. So uh, you've got a hard no dial uh, zone here. I'm going to answer a question because someone asked about tenant rep. I know we've been focusing on investment sales. So what would I advise a tenant rep was the question. It's simply this. If you do not have yourself aligned with a space planner, a contractor, an architect, and you think you're going to compete in this market, you're not. You've got to go in with a team and a solution to look at traffic flow, to look at setup, right? Look at everything regarding a space today because that, that tenant – they're not worried about their lease expiration, not at all. They're worried about the health and safety of their employees. And you got to go in with that solution if you think you're going to compete going forward, at least for the next foreseeable future. So here's what we're going to do. Look, I know, Candace, you got a huge pitch, so we're not going to hold you long. If you got to go, you got to go. Uh, Alan and Bob, there are so many questions coming in. I don't know your schedules. I should have asked. So, so what I think it's only fair to you guys is, we're going to pick the, and, and select the winner of the March, Massimo March Metrics Madness champion. Uh, and then if you still can be around, we certainly want to answer some questions for you all. Alan, don't get dressed yet. We got a little things to do. So before we go there, I thought I'd share with you all how we got here. So if I may, let me just grab something, share screen. Okay, so. Folks, first of all, this, if you don't know Alan Buchanan and Bob Mackle, this is who they are. This is their location, their role, their number of transaction volume they have done. Yes, Bob has done over $20 billion in transaction value compared to, to Alan's $1.7 billion. But that's freaking awesome. $1.7 billion. These are billion-dollar brokers, right? That's the point. That's what you need to get to. Now let's go to the numbers over the last six weeks, which, by the way, has nothing to do with the winner. So the numbers over the last six weeks, Alan and Bob, pretty much, you know, Alan was using that dollar. Bob met a tech guy and down to the dollar and he had good success. Wow, look at those calls completed, significant calls completed, inactive client dials. That was the one dial we're stressing to our members. That's the dial and the conversation you should be having everyone out there, making sure you're talking to those folks even now consistently, update weekly what's going on. That's what we want to hear. Um, referrals and leads, yes, listings, BK, seven listings in an otherwise totally stagnant market. Way to go, BK. Um, Alan had two listings and then closings. 
it was two for BK and none yet for Alan. This contest, however, was not based in any way on listings or closings. This was about, the whole objective of this contest was to get our members to focus on their clients and their prospects and be a resource. That was the goal. Now, next year, you can damn well bet closings and listings will be part of our, our contest. Yeah, the only time I wear this jacket is when I give out awards, usually to our Massimo members and our Massimo team. But this is the award we're going to give to either Alan or to Bob. And what I decided is this week, so far, if you look back, I said, okay, first week calls attempted, then calls completed, then we did inactive client calls. And I said, what else can I say? So I did something a little different here. Okay, here it goes. The, the metric for this week and just this week only, what you did in the past has no bearing at all. So the metric for this week was, in fact, referrals and or leads received. We haven't ever used that before. So let's try it now. BK for you this week, it was seven. And for Alan, the metrics were eight. And that makes our Massimo March metric madness champion, Mr. Alan Buchanan. Congratulations, Alan. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Amazing. Oh. Absolutely amazing. Well, Alan, any words from the champion as far as why you did what you did. Before you do, I want to share one thing with everyone. This is serious. I was on the phone yesterday with this. He was actually ranked the number five leader, expert leadership in the world by a couple of websites. And he said, Rod, we all think something is probable, but you don't know really what is possible. And Alan, it's fair to say, probable for you to make a couple hundred calls, 300 calls a week, but you found out what's possible when you push it. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. You bet. You bet. And um, just had to have that incentive, right? Had to have that, had to have that, uh, that tailwind, which is Mr. Knackle, who I've admired greatly since he and I had dinner together, what, a couple of years now? Yep. Yep. And, More than uh, a couple of years ago. I truly feel as though I'm the Y.E. Yang to his Tiger Woods. And if you're not a golf champ, Tiger has carried a lead into 15 major championships and I'm sorry, 16 major championships, and he's won 15 out of 16. And the only person to unseat him during that entire period was Y.E. Yang, never to be heard from again. So I hope I'm heard from again. <laughs> well, yeah. actually, you will, Alan. <laughs> congratulations, Doug. Congratulations, Alan. Bob, as your coach, I'm going to go to the drawing board and figure out what the hell did I do wrong. It's all on <laughs> Rod, Rod, let me tell you something. Uh, you did absolutely nothing wrong. It's all on me. Your coaching for uh, eight years now has been nothing but superb, and uh, I owe a lot of my success to you, so thank you for that. And, Alan, I just want to say congratulations. Um, I, I really felt like after seeing the numbers that you were putting up early, I was like, oh, my gosh, how am I ever going to compete with this guy? Uh, but you you motivated me to uh, to do more than I probably would have each week. And over the course of my career, I found that I have always learned a heck of a lot more from my losses and my failures than I have from my my wins and my successes. In fact, one of the things I love doing that I think has been one of the most educational things for me that's really helped me is every time I pitch business and lose, I call the owner. And not right away. I'll wait two, three, four weeks. Say, hey, you know, just, you know, always trying to improve myself. What could I have done better? Why did you go with the other guy uh, or gal? Um, and I've always learned so much from those. When, when owners are really truthful with me, uh, it can be extremely beneficial. And seeing the numbers that you put up, I got to tell you, I'll be calling you tomorrow or Saturday or Sunday <laughs> asking you how the heck you did it. Because there's no way I could have done more than I did because I was really trying hard and you just totally kicked my butt all over the place. So uh, thanks for doing that because now I've got a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, but I'm going to count on you to teach me how you did what you did. Yeah, so um, 
what a what a, what a gracious guy and and what an amazing producer and and what a what a true gentleman and and, and what a guy I I'm, I'm pleased to call my friend and and you started that I'm getting kind of chills here but uh, um, I wanted to quit about four times last week and between uh, my coach Doug and my wife Carla frankly they, they both said you know get out there and make 20 more dials get out there and, and, and crank that phone up so yeah absolutely a lot of fun well, yeah, no, you know I have uh, on my desk I have this little saying I don't know where the heck I got it it was in a magazine somewhere and it says do better than your best today and uh, man Alan you're making me do better than my best and Rod you do the same thing too so you guys this was great and I guess if the underlying basis of this rod was to uh, inject some fun uh, into a relatively dreary, potentially dreary time in the market, uh, you achieved your objective and it created motivation. And you know, hopefully those of you out there who um, you know, did, did not get as wrapped up in this thing as we did, you know, again, it's blocking and tackling. Make your calls, build your relationships, do all those fundamental things. And at the end of the day, you know, coming out of something like this, historically, this has always been a weeding out process for the marketplace. Uh, 20 or 30 percent of the brokers that were brokers two months ago are not going to be brokers six months from now. So there'll be less competition, more opportunity for those of us that are still around. Uh, and, uh, you know, that creates opportunity. It's exciting. There are new things to learn, uh, new ways to succeed. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, if you've been in this business for a while, uh, and you love it, you get pumped up about it. And, uh, this is a great opportunity to really advance your career, um, become more valuable to your clients, become a better friend to your clients and, uh, have some fun. And, you know, if you, you can't have fun doing what you do, uh, do something else, but this is, this is a great business. Thank yeah, and just one, just one final thing uh, that I have to share, and please tell, please give Aaron my best. But uh, a, a week or so ago, Bob and I were swapping texts. At least I thought I was swapping texts with Bob, and we're probably ten or fifteen exchanges back and forth, doing some serious trash talking. And all of a sudden, uh, the text comes up, and it says, uh, "By the way, this is Aaron, Bob's assistant. I've been texting you while Bob's been dialing the phone." <laughs> Yeah. And, Bob, and Bob, I want you to know, someone wrote in the, in the question and answer box, hey, you know what? A $90 million listing is not a bad consolation prize. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? That's no kidding. So, now I just have to sell it. <laughs> I just have to sell it. Right. Hey, in all seriousness, folks, we did, we did have some fun, but you did learn a lot, I'm hoping. You found this high value. It was all about you and what you need to do now going forward until, well, until the smoke clears those buildings that Bob's talking about and think about what Candace did, think about what Alan did, what Bob did, continue to do that, and you can move forward as well. I want to thank specifically Coach Doug Mollen for being part of this and for helping us throughout the last six weeks and making this a joy. Thank you so much, Doug. Hey, it's been a pleasure. And if I could just say one thing that, that I've learned through this is that the, the, this business is all about getting in front of people and establishing rapport and trust. Because once people like you and they trust you, they'll share what's going on in their life and the world, and you'll find opportunities in that regard. And this, these last six weeks were a great opportunity to, to help people in their greatest hour of need and establish more trust and more rapport than any other time that I can remember uh, in my 25 plus years in the business. And it really showed, showed up what, what uh, you haven't seen are the future opportunities that both the gentlemen are gonna uh, just re reap as a result of the efforts we put in over the last six weeks. It's, it's going to be incredible. Amen, brother. Bob, Alan, thank you so much, Doug, as well. Alan, congratulations. Thank you, <laughs> so Rod. happy for you. And to everyone else, as always, stay safe, remain vigilant, but don't forget what you heard today is nothing more than knowledge. What you do with it is going to make all the difference because knowing isn't doing. Okay, everyone, take care. Go get him, everybody.